John wasn't able to make it today. I'm his younger brother. <laughs> yeah. It was time, y'all. It was time. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm in the uh, witness protection program. <laughs> Nobody recognizes me. Yeah, it was time. Last time I was completely shaven, I think, was since six years ago or seven years? Six years ago, yeah. It's so when I traumatized my son, Walt, who's nine now. He was three at the time, and I thought I was going um, to, I thought I was going to do a prank on him, and so he was down for a nap, and while he was sleeping, I shaved my beard completely off, and then when he woke up, I was like, <laughs> freaked him right out like seriously he screamed and cried and it's like you know stranger danger he's looking for the phone to call 911 I'm like son it's me it's, he'll probably be talking to a counselor someday about that oh, son if that's the worst of your problems you've had it pretty good yeah <laughs> welcome to those joining us online as well Y'all say a prayer for us tonight. I'm going with a group to Stony Mountain, and I'll be there doing the message at their chapel. It's my first time to do this kind of thing, and so I'm excited about it, but um, I just really want to minister. You know, when my experience maybe is quite different than their experience, uh, but we have our humanity in common, we have a soul in common, right, as far as and we have a hope in common, too. So that's what I want to present tonight. Is, and maybe this will be an inroad for future ministry. I don't know. I'm just kind of, the Lord opened this door, so I'm going tonight. So probably about 7 o'clock tonight, maybe you could pause and whisper a prayer. I would appreciate it. We're jumping back into John. If you have your Bible, turn with me to John chapter 13. And I have to start expediting my preaching. I've realized that, right? Because we're in the gospel of John and what I like to do is walk through books of the Bible to get a complete picture of what God is saying through this book, through this author at that time. And so we're in John chapter 13, but what I'm trying to do, and y'all can pray for me because I have to select kind of which passages I'm going to study, which passages I'm going to preach on. That means I have to leave out some. Otherwise, we'd be in John for years. <laughs> There's so much there. I just want you to know, though, when I'm skipping over passages, it's not because they're inferior, insignificant in any way whatsoever, in any way, shape, or form. It's just for our purposes, you know, in order to finish the book of John this year, you know, I, we really, I really have to kind of start um, moving away from the verse-by-verse paragraph by paragraph style. That being said, today we're going to be looking at John chapter 14, but I could not skip over. So I'm going to give you a little bit about the end of John chapter 13. And to set the scene, Jesus is spending his final hours with his closest friends. He knows that in just hours, they're going to show up and arrest him. This is he, his last moments to get them ready for what's coming. And only he knows what's coming. They're still thinking that Jesus is going to come into power and it's David 2.0. Right? They're still thinking that Jesus is going to end up in some position of political power, going to evict the Romans who... God, the Israelites have been under the boot heel of the Romans for a long time. And so these are critical moments. I mean, just think about it. If you knew that you only had hours left and you had to prepare your family and your friends for the storm that is approaching, like these are critical moments where you really want them to get what you're about to say. John chapter 13, last week we looked at the washing of the feet and I challenged all of us to what? Scoop of the poop. And I hope you did some poop scooping this week at home. 
that you went out of your way to do something you wouldn't normally do so that someone else wouldn't have to do it. And you're not looking for recognition. It's a way of worshiping God. It's a way of serving God. And some of you may have seen the picture I posted on the living room page where I got up on Tuesday morning and I was talking about metaphorical poop. And the Lord said, what if it's not metaphorical? And there it was right there in the middle of the living room. I'm up early. No one else is up. So where's that bag I gave out on Sunday morning? Now, remember, I, I didn't use that bag because I told y'all that was the cheap one just for illustration purposes, right? The thin one. Like this, anyway, <laughs> you don't want to use that one. That's just a reminder. But I got down on the hands and knees and I scooped that poop and I got the spray bottle and I washed it off. And it wasn't like, you know, typically, honestly, like if I, if I wash a dish or I do something, you know, extra, I, I'm waiting on Amy to notice. Yeah, because I want a gold star, right? <laughs> you know? I, I want to be recognized like, hey, I did something, you know, like a kid. <laughs> uh, but that's, the motive isn't to be recognized or rewarded. It's, God, I want to do something to humble myself in this moment. And what, what, is, what does Jesus say? Your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He said, if you're doing it for the applause of people, like if you did something at work this week, like if the trash can was overflowing or somebody spilled something and just left it, right? And you, and you get a roll of paper towels and you walk across the room like this, <clears throat> you know, and you kind of draw attention to yourself and you're wiping it over there for 27 minutes and people are walking by looking at you. No, that's not, I mean, you've received your reward when people do this, right? Say, this is for him. This is for him. This is, this is me serving another person in the name of Jesus, and blessing other people. But then right after he does that, he predicts his betrayal. And then here's the one, verse 34. I just couldn't read over because it's so relevant in our context, in our day and age. In verse 34, Jesus says, and remember, he's not speaking to the masses. This is not, the, this is not him speaking to thousands of people or hundreds of people. This is Jesus speaking to us disciples, followers, those that have said, I want to follow you. You are my rabbi. I commit myself to you. Those that have already signed up, they're on the team. They're wearing the jersey. And he says to them, and he says to us, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And verse 35, by this, Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. A new command, which Jesus has given them lots of commands before this. So what does he mean by that? He means what I'm about to tell you is a superseding commandment. All the commandments I've just given you, he said, place this one at the top. A new commandment. This is a superseding commandment from Jesus to his followers, which means from Jesus to us. It is by this, all men will know that you are my followers, not by your morality. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do this, I don't do that. And you're checking all these boxes. I don't dress that way, I don't listen to that music, I don't go to those places, I don't do these things. It's not by our prohibitions that we should have identified as Jesus people by the love you have for each other, brothers and sisters in Christ. It should be so fierce and so blatant and so obvious that it is the distinguishing characteristic of Christianity. I can't believe how they love each other. And it creates a curiosity outside of the faith family. I cannot believe, like the way the way we treat each other and the radical generosity, not necessarily to the outside, but to the home team. I mean, it should blow people away. Like, okay, if somebody is struggling, not if, when, when somebody is struggling in the faith family, how we respond should get the attention of the folks on the outside. 
Whoa, that's not how we would respond as far as a bare minimum response to appease our guilty conscience. We'll toss a few in the plate or we'll do whatever. You know, like somebody standing with a cardboard sign at a red light, we kind of, you know, the ashtray, we dig out the toonies and loonies and quarters and dimes. I'm like, there you go, man, because I kind of feel guilty because you're looking at me right now. Do we do the same thing or have the same heart towards our brothers and sisters in Christ? The scraps, do they get the scraps? (laughs) Or is it, I mean, I'm telling you, How are Christians identified in our culture today in 21st century Winnipeg? If you were to ask non-Christians around the city and you were to say, what do you, like, how would you see Christians? Or how would you describe Christians? Would one of their first thoughts be they love each other? I disagree with their beliefs, but I cannot deny the love they have for each other. Is that what they would say? Talk to me about Christians. What do you think about Christians? Oh, they're against LGBT, whatever. They're against this. They're against that. You know what? They've hurt these people. They've hurt that people. It's like, okay, I'm not, I'm not saying that their assessment is right, but I am saying Jesus says that everyone Atheists, Muslims, Hindus, whatever, will know us by our love. Not by our, oh, are you a conservative? Are you a liberal? Are you an NDP? Do you support this, the Freedom Convoy? Do you not support that? Do you wear a mask? Do you not wear a mask? Are you obeying the orders from the government? Are you defying them? That's how we've been defined in our city, in our culture over the last four or five years. You Christians, you Christians. We gotta go back, man, to the original Jesus Christ himself, the founder of Christianity. And he says, this should be what defines you. You know what? I could not even go to John chapter 14 and shut her down and send us home, and that would be enough for me. To go above and beyond the bare minimum to go the extra mile. I mean, this is it. When someone says, hey man, I need, I really need $50 to make ends meet. And it's rare that someone has the humility to even ask. And rather than saying, you know what, I'll give you 50, we give them 100. Because we always usually ask because of our embarrassment, we always usually ask for less than what we actually need. And to understand that, to say, you know what? That's what Jesus said. When someone asked for your shirt, he said, give them extra. Give them a wardrobe. When someone says, go with me one mile, he says, you know what? Double it. Now, wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something? If somebody, if we started a policy of doubling the request, (laughs) hey, you know what? I need some food. Boom. Hey, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm cracking the whip here pretty hard, but y'all are, y'all are good. Y'all are doing this, okay? I mentioned last week that Amy uh, broke her butt ball. <laughs> okay. But it's been very painful for her, very painful. She hasn't been able to move very much. Like, it's been very painful, very hard week. And guess what? I got some food coming to the house. Man, I was eating cookies and they were made with love. I was eating lasagna and it was so delicious. You know, and then I, we got some, some, a whole truckload of stuff from Costco. You know, the stuff just kept coming, you know? And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is awesome. You should fall down the stairs more often. <laughs> it was so good. But love, love. No, no, I, 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 no way. I mean, that, no, never again, Lord. I don't want to speak anything. So yesterday at the funeral, you know, Alma's going through this very difficult time. It's hard. It's, it's impossible for us, unless those of you that have been married over 50 years or so, right? You can imagine maybe what it's like to lose someone that's been a part of your life for that long. And she hasn't been able to to be here a lot of Sundays because she's, uh, Albert needed constant care. And our church showed up, right? One of our sisters had a need 
and our church showed up. It's a whole team of people that showed up and man, we were trying to serve in whatever way. I mean, that's what I'm talking about though, where bam, we show up. We show up to say, hey, what do you need? What can we do? If someone, you know, if someone needs housing, hey, I, you know, I got a basement. Boom, boom. It's so countercultural, man. You know what I mean? I don't want somebody living in my house. You know, that's where I let my guard down. You know, that's where I eat my Cheetos on the couch in my PJs. You know, I don't want somebody in there. You know, then I'd have to go into pastor mode all the time and like, hey, brother, how art thou? It's like, no, man, I'm just trying to brush my teeth. No, that's, but to, to be countercultural in that way with each other, I'm not saying invite someone in off the street. I'm saying a brother or sister. I'm saying family. That's what you do with family. Somebody says, you know what? I, you know, uh, my, uh, my vehicle is, is uh, kaput. You know what? I got a spare. <laughs> Toss them the keys. Use it, until you, use it as long as you need it. What? Wait, what? No, I can't. So it's one thing to give it. It's another thing to receive it. I can't. I can't. Why not? It's your pride. Receive the blessing. Take it. Praise God for it. Gosh, I can't. I wasn't in the sermon. John chapter 14. Gosh, man. So, I don't know if I should. Yeah, that was good. It's good. I needed to hear that myself. Didn't even study that, you know. I was just, I was going to give a little appetizer before the, the prime rib, you know. That was the blooming onion, Jason. That was the uh, outback, anybody? <laughs> John chapter 14, I'm going to condense it. Some of y'all are like, oh, gosh, we in for it today. I should have packed a lunch. John chapter 14, and remember, there's no chapter breaks or verse um, divisions in the original. This was added way later. This was added hundreds of years later to help us study the Bible. But in the original, it's all one flow. And so sometimes it's this, um, we we use these uninspired breaks and it breaks and and it, I think, interrupts, that's the better word. It interrupts the, the original message or the original thought pattern, flow, thought flow. So Jesus is still in the upper room with his disciples. He's just, they're about to leave to the garden where he's going to pray and going to sweat blood, right? So he's in the final hour or so in the upper room with his disciples. Judas has already left. Jesus, Judas took the Lord's Supper. Judas got his stanky feet washed by Jesus, and then he left to betray Jesus. And so now Jesus is with them, and these are some critical moments And he says this, stand in body or in spirit in honor of the reading of God's word. John chapter 14, beginning in verse one, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone that has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. 
And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. The word of the Lord. You can grab a seat. Jesus knows that the clock is ticking, that the fuse is close to the powder. He knows that their world's Their world is about to fall apart. Their world is about to become unraveled. Their world is about to implode. And so he is preparing them for what is about to happen. And what is the first thing he says to his closest friends? Do not let your hearts be troubled. That is a relevant word, isn't it? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of y'all have a troubled heart? That's me. How could we not? (laughs) When you look in the mirror and you begin to think about all of the struggles and the temptations and the doubts within my own heart, within your own life, when you glance in the rearview mirror and you think about the times that you did what you shouldn't have done or you didn't do what you should have done, and all of this is swirling below the surface of our own lives, it's enough to trouble our hearts. And then There's this turmoil within us, but then when you look out around us, you see what's happening with your family. You see what's happening with your spouse. You see what's happening with your children, with your grandchildren, and you see the struggles and you're doing everything you can to help them avoid some of the heartache that you had, but they won't listen sometimes. It's called free will. And it troubles your heart to see them in trouble. And you look up from your own family and you see the situations around the world and it's so easy to have a troubled heart because you see what's happening. And and you know, especially if you go down these social media rabbit holes. Oh, the phone's blipped out, right? And then I'm reading these things about China, you know, preparing for a big cyber attack and you know, we're... You know, people are buying uh, supplies and you see what's happening over with Russia and Ukraine. You see what's happening uh, with, in the Middle East with Israel and with Palestine and, you know, and bombs are going off and everybody's talking and like, what's going on in the States, you know, with, and you know, with Texas and is it going to be a civil war back home where we're from? Can you see how easy it is in our world today to have a troubled heart? an anxious heart, a disturbed heart. When you're laying there at night and you're trying to go to sleep, but your heart is beating and your mind is moving, thinking about what we should do, thinking about how we should prepare for whatever might be coming, thinking about your loved ones that are in trouble. Jesus knows that their hearts are about to be very troubled. And so he gives them, actually, it is an imperative. You know what an imperative is? In the language of the Bible, it's a commandment. Do not let your hearts be troubled. So he he says it, I think, in a pastoral tone, right? He's not saying like a drill sergeant moving back and forth. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Sir, yes, sir. No, he's with his closest friends. He just washed their feet. They just had the supper together, right? And he's, they're, they're leaning in together and it's at night and there's lamplight around them. And you imagine the scene here where it's very personal. And he's telling them in a pastoral tone, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. And then he says some outrageous things in this chapter. People that want to say, well, Jesus wasn't good. Jesus never claimed to be God. Have you read the Bible? I mean, I don't know what version you're using, but I mean, just in the Gospel of John. Remember John chapter 1, those outrageous, preposterous statements he was making? And now here he is again. He said, Philip, 
or was it Philip or one of them? He said, if you've seen me, you've seen God. So people that want to say Jesus was a good teacher, a role model, listen, either he was who he said he was, which was God in the flesh, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, or he was a lunatic. Normal people don't say this stuff, man. Hey, I, God is in me. God is through me. And when you interact with me, you're hanging out with God. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then verse two, this is, uh, this, these next two verses where I'm going to have to stop today, but it's interesting, okay? You guys fact check me on this because I didn't have time to fully fact check myself, but I think this is the only place, at least that I've been able to find in the gospels where Jesus describes heaven. I'm just thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because he talks about heaven, he, and actually he doesn't talk about heaven that much. He talks a lot more about hell actually than he does about heaven. It's, Jesus is love. Yes, he is. But he also, in love, spoke some things that are pretty disturbing. But he describes heaven here. And he talks about treasures in heaven. And then Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven, which the other gospel writers talk about the kingdom of God. But Matthew changed the kingdom of heaven. But when it comes to the actual place, heaven, I think this is the only place where he describes it. It's interesting. So that should cause all of us to put it in part. So wait a minute. Okay, if this is the only place where Jesus is describing heaven, not just referring to heaven, then this is pretty important. Because remember, he only has moments left, only hours left with his closest followers. And he's saying, do not have a troubled heart. I'm going to tell you how to not have a troubled heart. So the diagnosis is troubled hearts. The prescription is what he's about to give them. He says, you guys are going to have troubled hearts sooner than you think. The storms of life are going to rock the boat, maybe even capsize it. You're going to be floating out there on a plank of wood thinking it's game over. You're going to doubt and question everything you thought you believed in. So what are you going to do in those moments? He says, believe in me. And then he goes right into this. In my father's house, there are many rooms. Now, the King James says many mansions, many mansions. And that was not the best translation of that word in the language of the New Testament. <laughs> Many rooms, and it really is, it seems, it seems subtle, right, when it comes to the, the difference between mansions and rooms. Uh, it, it seems like semantics, but it, it, it's a massive difference when it comes to the implications. Because mansions means I'm going to have my own mansion in heaven, <laughs> And then you might have your mansion beside me and you might have your mansion on the, across the street from me and we're going to be walking the streets of gold, hanging out in our mansions in heaven. But when it's changed to room, now all of a sudden it's a whole different eschatology, baby. Now all of a sudden it's one mansion with many rooms. Jesus says, in my father's house, there are many rooms. And he said... I'm, I don't lie to you. Hey, this is not some pie in the sky by and by, right? You ever heard that before, you Christians? You're so heavenly minded, you're of no earthly good. I don't think that could be, I don't think I could be accused of that particular thing. Come on now, are we so heavenly minded or are we too earthly minded? How many of y'all just think about heaven all day and you, and you don't go to work? And the boss says, hey, were you sick yesterday? No, actually, I just got called up thinking about glory. <laughs> Hanging out with Jesus. Or how many of you just missed an appointment? You know, I was supposed to meet you for coffee yesterday, but I just got to dreaming about heaven. No, come on now. For most of us, it's the opposite. It, can we be honest? Well, we're so focused on the grind, on the hustle, that we rarely think about heaven. Jesus says, in my Father's house are many rooms. I'm not going to lie to you. And this is, so this is 
a mini-series within the series. This sermon today is Troubled Hearts Part 1. Next week will be Troubled Hearts Part 2 because in verse 27, he says it again. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So Troubled Hearts Part 2 will be next week where he gives really the key ingredient, the prescription, the key part of the prescription is the Holy Spirit, which he spends the next couple chapters talking about. But this is the first part of the prescription. He says, listen, always remember that this world is not your final destination. Always, regardless of how bad it gets, when the ship is capsized and you're floating on a plank and it's cold and the water has ice in it and you see the fins swirling around you, the sharks are hungry and you're sitting there thinking, it could it get any worse? I said, remember, that's not the end. Always remember that there is more to the story. And it's real. He says, I'm not lying to you. I'm not telling you a fairy tale. Some people think that heaven is, is just a myth or a fantasy that, that people made up so we could feel better at funerals to give you something to comfort you in your grief. It didn't come from me and it didn't come from my forefathers. It came from Jesus. It came from God to say, this isn't all there is. And when you put it all together, it makes sense, man. You got the bookend of Genesis and the bookend of Revelation, and you back up from the particular passage, and you see the bigger picture, and you say, you got Eden 1.0, God with man on earth forever. No pain, no sickness, no death. Fast forward to Revelation chapters 21 and 22. You got God with man on earth, no pain, no death. Eden 2.0, it completes the circle, man. It's all a part of the same story. In my father's house are many rooms. And I want you to think about for a moment how our physical reality is a shadow of the ultimate spiritual truth. Think about that, it's kind of like Plato's cave in the Republic, where we get so focused on the shadow, we begin to think that the shadow is real. And it's a delusion. So for instance, we can reverse engineer heaven, okay? So the, really the Bible, doesn't describe a lot about heaven. We know it's there, we know it's awesome, but there isn't, most of the Bible, most of Jesus, most of the epistles, most of the New Testament is focused on here and now. How do we live as Christians right now in this world? How do we live out our faith? And so when you reverse engineer heaven, you say, okay, God has baked in signposts that point to heaven within creation. When you think about it, okay, let's think about marriage. Marriage, even for those that never get married, marriage is a message. You can't focus on the shadow. There is a bigger spiritual reality. The church, the Bible calls the church the bride of Christ. Jesus, as the groom, will come and be joined to the bride. So he came the first time as a suffering servant. He's gonna come the next time as a conquering king. And when he comes back, the bride needs to be ready, right? We have to be ready, we have to be anticipating, we have to be waiting and watching. And then there's something called the marriage supper of the lamb. When these two come together, and I want you to think about this because Jesus is preparing them for a time when he's going to be away. He's preparing them to live out their newfound Christianity in a hostile environment without him physically present. Now, is that relevant? It should be relevant because we're in this season now that's gone on for thousands of years where we're doing our best to live out our faith with Jesus is physically in heaven. 
His resurrected body is in heaven and we are on earth. And so he's telling them, this is how you do it. It is possible. It won't be easy, but it's possible. And so we have to listen in to say, Jesus, we're living out our faith in this hostile environment, in this broken and dark and troubled world. Marriage is a message. Then when you, when you have a, a marriage that perhaps will turn into a family. Children, okay? Let me use my own life as an illustration. We have three kids and right now we all live in the same house. Different rooms, same house. And so I wanna connect the dots here again. I want you to stop being so fixated on the shadow and to see the ultimate reality, the message that God is preaching through these very physical realities. In my house, we have children where we have, we're all under the same roof, but we're in different rooms. And it's interesting here. Jesus says, I go there to prepare a place for you. So there's something here that's very personal. Actually, that is in the singular, it's not in the plural. He's not saying I go there to, a play, to prepare a place for y'all. He says, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, no one knows us like Jesus. No one knows us like God. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And so he is preparing something just for us. It's not that we're gonna be in a white robe sitting before the throne, two, four, seven, three, six, five, forever, just singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Heaven is so much, it is that, but it's more than that. Where he's talking about a dwelling place for me, for them. And it's going to be customized. It's going to be personalized. And then when he says this, if I go and prepare, I'll come get you and I will walk you into your room that I have made ready for you. And so what is he talking about here? There is a part that he's talking about his return, but I, he's talking to these specific brothers. And I think when they died, Jesus was there and he he ushered them, walked them into the place that he had prepared for them. Now, that is a comforting thought. That when we die, not if we die, when we die, that Jesus will be there in that moment and it'll be seamless. And he will take us to this place that he has made ready for us. Now, how do we, how do we have a room in heaven? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no person comes to the Father except through me. Now, the context matters right here. So a lot of people want to take that verse and use it and talk to non-Christians or talk to Muslims or talk to, and I'm, I'm not saying it can't be used in that way. I'm saying it wasn't originally used in that way. He's talking to his closest friends and followers. And he's saying, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And there is one door into this heavenly mansion that has many rooms. I am the door. The only way into the mansion is through me. And the only way into the family of God is through faith in me. Jesus said, I am the way. He said, listen, things are going to get dark. You're going to feel lost. You're going to feel confused. When we cannot see the next step on the narrow path to this heavenly dwelling, when we're paralyzed by fear of the unknown, look up and follow the light. You know how, you know how hard that is? You know, everything inside of us. I remember one time back in my wilder days, I bungee jumped. That's because on our honeymoon. She wouldn't do it. I was like, come on, there's a big marshmallow down there. I mean, it's not like it. But all the same, I knew that there were all these safety measures built in. But I got to the edge of that little diving board, and I, my body was like, no. 
idiot, don't do it. What are you doing? <laughs> Jumping off this cliff. When we're paralyzed by fear, that's what it feels like. <laughs> you know, we just didn't do it and everything's dark around us and you don't want to move because that might be, you know, into a canyon. Who knows, right? What, what you're, so when you're, we're paralyzed by fear, we're not moving anywhere. So our faith is stagnant. We just, it's dark. I don't want to go. I don't know which way to go. And you hear the, the twigs snap out in the darkness and you're like, oh my gosh. You hear the coyotes yip out in the night. You feel hunted. You feel vulnerable. What are you going to do? You just going to hunch down? No. Lift your eyes to the light. And there is a light at the end of this tunnel. <laughs> and it is Jesus. It is heaven. I'm just going to, and this takes some faith. I'm just going to step towards the light. One step at a time. Jesus says, I am the way. So Lord, if you ain't the way, then I'm in trouble. When you can't see what's in front of you, right? You might trip over something. There might be a snake cold up there. You never know, right? You just don't know. You might step off of a cliff and say, I trust. I'm going to trust my heavenly father and I'm going to keep stepping. Push through your fear and keep stepping in faith. So how do we, there's an on-ramp onto the way. Jesus is the way. We have to have an on-ramp onto the way. In the book of John chapter one, says this, because we have to be a part of the family of God in order to be in the house of God with the people of God, right? He's the father. In these four chapters, Jesus refers to God as father 50 something times, 50 something times, the father, the father, the father, the father. He is the father. We are the children. And so how do we become a part of the family of God so that we can, no matter what, have our destination locked in no matter what. I don't care what you do to me in this life. You know what, I'm sitting there in a hospital bed and they're telling me I only have whatever, hours, days. And yes, it's hard, yes, it's hard. Yes, there's grief, but there's a joy that I'm gonna get there before you. And I'm gonna say, brother, I'll be waiting for you when you cross the line, when you come over. I'll be high-fiving and chest bumping right there at the pearly gates. Right there is that, we don't grieve as people that don't have faith, but our grief is flavored with hope. Say, ah, this is not some fairy tale. I believe this in my core, in my heart. No, it's true. John chapter one says this beginning in verse 12. Yet to all who did receive Jesus, to those that believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And here's my concluding question. What is your final destination? Come on now. Say, uh, are you in the are you on the front porch of the house of God or are you a part of the family? Are you hanging out in the yard on the tire swing on the seesaw? Or are you in the living room? You know, are you a part of the family of God? That's the question. What is your final destination? Because that makes all the difference. That's what Jesus says. We're going to have troubled hearts. You're going to feel like your life is over. Everything's going to become unraveled. And you're floating on that plank of wood in the winter at water. And the sharks are swimming around you. What's going to keep you from despair? Knowing that this is not the end for me. And in some places of the world where it's dangerous to be a Christian, why do they not renounce their faith? Because it's real. And they're, they're saying, you know what? You can torture me. You can send me to some re-education camp. You can kill me, but I will never renounce Jesus because he's, he's the most real thing I've ever encountered in this world. And I know, I know that there is a heaven. So matter of fact, you pull that trigger because you're doing me a favor. Just to have that attitude, right? To say a reckless abandonment, to say, I can take risk here. 
I can take that step here because even if it don't work out, it will, all, in the end, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And he says that's the prescription for fear. When you feel like a failure, when you feel like it's over, when you feel like there's nothing left for you, you keep stepping because of where you're going, not because of where you are. So how do you onboard onto that? Some of y'all today might say, I've been on the front porch, man. I I just come for a visit every now and again. I'm not a part of the family. Well, today could be the day that you merge onto the way by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. And it's not some complicated thing where you got to jump through these hoops. You got to memorize some words. You got to come to a place and you got to make some movements. No, no, no. It's between you and Jesus, man. And all you have to do is say, Jesus, I need you. That's it. That is the biblical prayer of salvation. If you're online right now and you're watching this, you don't have to come to some holy place. You don't have to come to some building with a steeple. You don't have to talk to a professional religious person. Right there, right now, in your vehicle, on that treadmill, right now, in your living room. That When Jesus was walking by, all those people that needed him, all they said was mercy, have mercy on me. All they said was Jesus, help me. And he said, stopped and he healed them so there's something called the sinner's prayer which isn't a bad thing but sometimes it's more than what we need sinner's prayer says lord jesus i know that i'm a sinner and my sin separates me from you and the only way that i can reconnect with god and find peace in my heart is by accepting you into my life save me lord forgive me of my sins And if you want to use that, fine, but it needs to be your words, not my words. Not some priest telling you what to pray, but you're talking to your father, right? And he loves you and he's searching for you and he he wants to find you. And when he finds you, he's not doing this. He's not threatening you. He's doing this. He's there to rescue you, to save you, not just for this life, but for all eternity. So if that's you today, Maybe you're here today and you haven't made that decision. And how do I get in? You know, how do I get in? I don't know. I'm walking around the house. I'm on the front porch. I hang out with the family, but I'm not really. I'm a friend of the family. I am not the family. So all you got to do is walk up to the door. Jesus is going to open it. He said, I really want in. I really want to be a part of your family. And he'll step aside. He is the door, by the way. Come on in. And you will feel like you are home. For the first time probably in your life, you feel like you're home. That you, this is a place you always should have been. This is a place where they saved a seat for you even when you weren't there. Well, let's bow our head, close our eyes. And I'm going to give you an opportunity here if you want to not be a friend of the family, but to actually join the family. John chapter 1 says, you have the right through Jesus to become a child of God by placing your faith in him. You say, I, I want in. I want to be a part of this family, this eternal family. And I want, to, I want to know where I'm going when I die. I don't want to have to wonder where I'm going. I want to know Deep down that no matter what happens to me in this world, the best part of my life is when it's over. If that's you here today, just maybe slip your hand up and say, I really want to be a part of God's family. Anybody here that says, hey, I, online right now, if you're listening to this, to say, listen, I, you're talking to me. You know, I've been... I've been at the family meetings, but I I feel like a stranger because I'm not family. I'm a friend of the family. And if that's you, all you got to do is say, Jesus, save me. Come into my life. Take over because I've made a mess of it. And I want to follow you. Whatever Whatever I have left, I give to you. And if you prayed that prayer, if you've just joined the family of God, then tell somebody about it. Text me, call me, find me on Facebook, Instagram. Tell someone in your family. 
Because we want to celebrate with you. When you come in, we're like, hey, we've been waiting on you, man. Come on in. Yes. And everybody's celebrating with tears in their eyes saying, we love you. We've been waiting. You've made us better now that you're here. And for the rest of us, for the rest of us maybe that have troubled hearts and we need to recalibrate our gaze. We need to recalibrate our focus. So if you, those of you today that say, you know what? I have a troubled heart, brother. I have a disturbed heart. And it's anxiety that is overwhelming. There's the stress that is suffocating. And today I need some help, brother. I need some help to lift my gaze from my circumstance and to see the light at the end of the tunnel. If that's you, just raise your hand up. Say, pray for me. I need some help. I have a troubled heart. And I can't lift my head on my own. Heavenly Father, we pray right now that you'd place people around us that will whisper in our ear this isn't the end there is more to your story keep believing keep believing when the odds are stacked against us keep believing when all hope seems lost keep believing the journey will be hard with the breathtaking highs and the heart-crushing lows, but the destination will be worth it. In Jesus' name, amen. 